Good evening, everybody. I remain Larry Mason, former college professor for eight years and the computer system administrator for 30 years. I still feel very obligated to Michael Shanklin and all those who help him bring you the Voluntary Virtues Network. Without such generosity, you would not be hearing my voice. I enjoy lecturing as much as any professor, but I will have more fun when we move to live shows so my listeners can ask questions and correct my errors. However, we must make do with these pre-recorded lectures for the time being. This speech is the 24th in the Invisible Hand series of talks, all of which involve money in one way or another. Invisible Hand is also the name of the novel which I hope this series of talks will inspire you to read if you have not already done so. Reading or listening to it will cost you only time since it is freely available on the internet in both text and mp3 formats at nopomstuff.info or if you're willing to spend a buck on Amazon you can download the whole novel to your Kindle. End of commercial message. Tonight's main theme is about common ownership and moneyless economies. As background for this presentation, I will provide a brief summary of the conclusions of the first presentation in this Invisible Hand series, which examined the physical object nature of our money and some of the unfortunate consequences of that nature. I will be concise, so if you have already seen one or more of the earlier presentations, don't worry, this review won't take long. All money in history and prehistory has been considered to be or to represent physical objects such as a basket of grain, a cow, a coin, or a paper bill. Today most money is in computer accounts and though it zips around the world from account to account at almost the speed of light, it is still treated as if it were a physical object of some sort. Because we treat money as if it were a physical object, anything which is true of physical objects in general will also be true of money. This obvious point is ignored by economists and others who talk and write about money even though it is the most important truth about money. The importance of the physical object nature of money cannot be overstated. What follows are some of the consequences of that physical object nature. First, money is like other physical objects in that it can be taken from its owner against that owner's will by force, fraud, or stealth and it can also be lost or destroyed. This means that you need to suspect almost everyone of trying to get your money by fair means or foul. Second, money must be amoral because all inanimate physical objects are amoral. Even animals are amoral in that they have neither an ethical sense nor morality, especially when they are used as commodity money. You can use your physical object money for anything, good or bad. Third, the money supply is independent of the supply of goods and services for sale because the supply of one physical object is independent of the supply of other objects. Fourth, money falsely simulates a zero-sum game in monetary transactions because the money gained by one party must be lost by some other party or parties. Money makes us think that other people can gain money at our expense and that we can only gain money at their expense. It makes us treat others as if they were competitors, rivals, opponents, or even enemies. Fifth, Money is almost impossible for a society or nation to control. In every nation that attempts to limit, regulate, or tax trade, a black market comes to exist, and organized crime flourishes in all nations. Sixth, money transactions are two-party interactions. Two-party interaction is inherently unstable because if one party gets an advantage in power, such as having more money, the stronger party can use that power to gain still more advantages. This is particularly true of money. The old saying, them as has gets, is true. Possession of money does make getting more money quite a lot easier. Naturally, the weaker party in such two-party interaction will eventually want to end the interaction. Thus, the relationship is unstable. Keeping that review in mind, let's consider the idea of common ownership and moneyless economies. I must start by saying that I am not at all expert in moneyless economies in general nor in any specific moneyless economy in particular. No matter what I say about any such economy, my description of its features will almost certainly be wrong, at least to some degree. I would leave those who advocate for each such economy to speak for themselves. However, I will be able to point out some general features of human societies in history and prehistory which bear upon the descriptions, as I state them, of proposed moneyless economies. So I will say something of the pattern Moneyless economy X claims that it will work by doing such and such. In the past, such and such has worked only under ABC circumstances. Therefore, since we cannot expect to have those circumstances, this kind of moneyless economy will probably not work. 
Note that my statement of the such and such is what I am criticizing, not the theoretical moneyless economy which may not actually employ such and such at all. I may have misunderstood that moneyless economy. So with this disclaimer to somewhat mitigate my sins in misrepresenting the ideas of others, I shall proceed in my usual arrogant fashion to talk as if I were all-knowing about social matters. Wikipedia, our old friend when searching for public consensus on the meanings of terms, says that communism is, quote, a socioeconomic system structured upon common ownership of the means of production and characterized by the absence of social classes, money, and the state. Unquote. That sounds fine to me. I know that is not how nations claiming to follow Marxist ideology actually operate, but it's common ownership we are after here, not economic practices in totalitarian dictatorships. You will have noticed, I hope, that the definition includes no money and no state or government. The old bait-and-switch principle of offering one thing and giving another is clearly at work here when advocates for communism offer a system with no government and then impose a draconian government on the poor suckers who help put them in power. Something sadly similar has happened with several religious groups which have come together around some charismatic minister or cleric, having been told that by giving up their worldly goods they will be able to experience a truly loving society which is of the spirit rather than of the material world. Then they find themselves being coerced and otherwise forced to live by someone else's standards. So communism and the promise of other moneyless economies should not be confused with actual outcomes of attempts to socially build an actual permanent moneyless economy which thrives in the real world. I turn next to The Moneyless Manifesto by Mark Boyle. I remind you that I am not an expert in Marx's system and may well misrepresent it by quoting out of context or just not understanding it. But the book defines, quote, a pure moneyless economy, in my definition, is the meeting point of the gift economy and the 100% local economy, unquote. Yes, he is quite serious about that 100% local economy part. He claims it, quote, is a model of economy that enables its participants to meet their physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual needs, both collectively and individually, on the basis of materials and services being shared unconditionally, i.e. no explicit formal exchange. Ideally, but not necessarily, these materials would be procured within walking distance of the people who benefit from them." Unquote. You see, that's an extremely local economy with very little division of labor. There is no provision for infrastructure such as weather satellites and high-tech medicine. In other words, this system is basically a return to the Paleolithic. I really don't think most folks would like that lifestyle, especially if they need prescription medication for their health, or a CPAP machine to sleep well, or even if they simply like science. It's true that in the Paleolithic there was no money in use, but there were lots of problems the people of that time faced which they could not solve, and life for most was brutal and short. I would also contend that any of a number of natural disasters could end humanity altogether. The supervolcano Toba almost rendered humanity extinct about 70,000 years ago. We can only survive if we greatly increase our level of technology, since the universe seems totally uninterested in preserving us. Therefore, for me, I, am t I totally reject any turn away from increasing science and technology. Next, let's consider what is called a resource-based economy or post-scarcity economy. The Venus Project organization is supporting this concept. I have no knowledge of the organization and will base my comments on information provided by others. I may well misrepresent this economic system too. Once again, I will criticize what I believe to be some aspect or property of the proposed system rather than the system itself. The Venus Project describes a resource-based economy thusly, quote, a resource-based economy is a system in which all goods and services are available without the use of money, credits, or barter, or any other system of debt or servitude. All resources become the common heritage of all the inhabitants, not just a select few. The premise upon which this system is based is that the earth is abundant with plentiful resources. Our practice of rationing resources through monetary methods is irrelevant and counterproductive to our survival." Unquote. This is a weak definition, but it definitely excludes money or any other medium of exchange. Exactly how these resources are to be distributed 
and how the motivational structure is to be arranged is unstated. In other words, the system is not described. That sort of cuts the heart out of any definition of an economy. So this moneyless system, which also has almost everything held in common, which I assume means collective ownership, is more a dream world than something we could socially construct. The web pages have lots of pretty pictures but lack the details of how things work. Well, that about does it for the first four to five pages of Google links to moneyless economies. The pickings are rather slim. So let's resort to just thinking about the prospect of an economy which owns everything in common and or is moneyless. I know that's a radical thing to do, but tough times call for tough people, so here we go. I will assume here that common ownership does not apply to personal belongings like underwear and toothbrushes. In fact, I will exclude such things as one's home, furniture, and automobile. But that still leaves quite a lot of goods unaccounted for. To begin with, we have those huge capital infrastructure items like dams, bridges, airports, and sewer systems. If they are owned by everyone, who is responsible for their maintenance? If I am an owner of Hoover Dam out west, am I supposed to drive 3,000 miles several times a year to check on the dam and perform maintenance work? Or can I leave that to the people of Nevada? How is that to be organized? There are hundreds of millions of us U.S. citizens and common ownership would have all of us own Hoover Dam. But I really don't think we can all just show up to perform maintenance work. If we did somehow manage to work out the maintenance problems, we would still have the problem of who makes decisions for Hoover Dam. When do we increase or decrease the flow of electricity from the dam or the flow of water over, around, or through the dam? These operational decisions must be made in a timely fashion for efficient production of the dam's benefits. Do we hundreds of millions of owners get to vote on what to do this morning? Or do we get to vote on who is in charge of the, at the dam? Neither of these options seems to be at all practical to me. So if I am an owner of Hoover Dam, but I don't get to make any decisions regarding the dam and I have nothing to do with its maintenance, in just what meaningful sense am I in any way an owner? That sounds to me like no one owns Hoover Dam if everyone owns Hoover Dam. Now let's extend that problem to the other millions of things which are large capital structures in the U.S. Common ownership of big things sounds to me like no ownership at all. But what about smaller things like, say, a dump truck? It's true that everyone owns the truck and there are lots of people who can maintain a truck. I don't happen to be one of those people, but I am confident that there are many thousands of people who work with trucks who could maintain it. So which of those thousands will maintain the truck? Who has the right to do so and who has the obligation to do so? How is that determined? I can see how confusion over who was going to change the oil in the truck could easily result in a destroyed engine or a mix-up on who was going to check the brakes causing a brake failure to occur. How would it be possible for hundreds of millions of owners of some item to have meaningful ownership rights and responsibilities? I just cannot see how that could possibly be accomplished. At this level, as well, there would appear to be no ownership at all, if all shared collective ownership. So those are goods ownership problems, and we haven't even mentioned services. Are services owned collectively as well? Labor is a form of capital. Do I share in the ownership of my neighbor's labor? If he can fix that dump truck, can I order him to fix it? Do I also own the labor of the policeman such that I can order him to arrest my neighbor for refusing to fix that dump truck, which I and 300 million other people own? It seems to me that would be slavery. Ownership of labor would be a little tricky. The same who's in charge here problems we had with large and small capital goods and their maintenance would appear to exist for capital labor. So collective ownership of labor doesn't seem like it could work at all. Again. Collective ownership with over 300 million owners appears to be no ownership at all. We've done goods and services, so what about ideas or knowledge? What about intellectual property? What does it mean to say that we all own the Why Does a Chicken Cross the Road joke? Or the novel Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain? Or the formula for Coca-Cola? Or pictures of scantily clad celebrities? Do I have to have any control of some idea or set of words or image in order to own it? If I write down an idea on paper, or print it using my wireless printer in my laptop, does that give 300 million people any more property than they had 10 minutes before? Then there's the question of whether children share in this collective ownership. 
At what age can one exercise these ownership rights? What changes for a young person upon reaching the age of 13 or 18 or 21 or whatever the age of adulthood is considered to be? How could one tell if one was an owner of all these things or not? Finally, if ownership is a right with respect to other people concerning some good service or whatever, and if everybody has the same right, then why notice that right at all? We all have a right to inhale, but do you hear people talking about how important that right is and how we must have an economy which respects that right? I sure don't. So the whole concept of collective ownership with regards to anything at all is silly. It's meaningless. It's obviously a political idea intended to rouse the emotions rather than have any meaning. Ownership is meaningful only when it gives some particular person a special relationship to something whether that thing is physical, social, or mental, which no other person has. If no one is excluded, if no one is special in ownership, the concept of ownership is lost, meaningless, pointless, and silly. So why does anyone propose common ownership of anything? Historically, no one, or everyone, depending on how you want to look at it, owned certain lands. If those lands were forest, anyone could enter the forest to collect firewood, nuts and berries, to hunt for wild game, or to allow one's pigs to eat whatever they could find there. If those lands were meadowlands, one could graze one's sheep or goats or cattle or horses or oxen on the grass that grew there. These were the commons. I'm sure you're all familiar with the tragedy of the commons. The lack of ownership resulted in overuse of the commonly owned resource such that it was destroyed as a resource. Today we have the ocean and the atmosphere as commons. People around the world dump their garbage into the air and the ocean. Yes, carbon dioxide coming out of the exhaust pipe of your car is garbage. You don't want it and you are throwing it away into the air. By that means we destroy those commonly owned or commonly unowned resources. We did it with the passenger pigeon and with the cod and many other resources. But the common man could avail himself of those resources to better his own life. He could gather firewood to keep his hovel warm and cook his food. He could hunt for deer to put meat on the table. He could graze a few goats on the commons to feed his children milk. He could fish in the seas and streams. When the king or a noble took possession of the forest and banned hunting and the gathering of firewood, the peasant suffered. When the noble fenced in the commons to keep everyone else's sheep from grazing there, the peasant suffered. When the rich banned fishing in the lakes and streams they owned, the peasant had to do without fish. So to the peasant, the idea that the forest, the meadow, the lakes and streams belonged to everyone sounded good because that meant he could use them freely. When the factories and mines and roads were built and owned by just a few people, the idea that those few owners could get rich from just owning those capital intensive goods was repugnant to the poor who worked in those factories and mines and had to pay tolls to use those roads. To the poor, the idea that those sources of wealth belonged to everyone in common sounded like a way to get a cut of the profits. But of course, no one ever explained just how that was all going to work. The sellers of the idea just kept pointing out how unfair it was for the rich few to get even richer just because they owned the means of production. They just kept selling the idea of something, all that capital, for nothing, common ownership was better than no ownership. The politicians never bothered to point out that common ownership meant that nobody owned it. Of course, if you didn't own anything except the clothes on your back, the idea of having at least a share of all that stuff sounded pretty good. Today, the idea of common ownership is still a fraud. It's meaningless and silly. If someone proposes it, look for the man behind the curtain because there's no way it can work in reality unless we all go back to living naked on the coast of a lake in Africa. On to the next idea, a moneyless economy. Money provides many functions for an economy, of which three of the most important are medium of exchange, standard unit of account, and store of value. So what those who propose a moneyless economy are suggesting is that these functions do not need to be performed or provided for an economy. I think that's ridiculous, and here's why. To start with, people are mutually interdependent. There's no such thing as a completely self-made man. No one changed their own diapers when they were infants. No one discovered how to acquire food on their own. No one invented language for themselves as a means to think. You do think in words, don't you? You cannot remember anything from before you could talk, do you? You learned what you know from other people, either directly or indirectly. The clothing you wear and the tools you use were not created by yourself from scratch from ores and plants and animals. 
So it's obvious that people need each other and provide things to each other. We call that exchange of goods and services trade. Much of trade is done without money. We give each other gifts of goods and services, especially within a family, without any money flowing the other way. That works just fine. You can even go out into the woods and survive using clothing and tools you obtain by using money or by gifts from friends. You can live with a small group, with only a few hundred people at most, with most of the goods and services provided without the use of money on an informal basis. People lived like that for thousands of years before the development of commodity money, cities, and government. It works if you live in a hunting and gathering economy. It can work in the commune or the kibbutz too to some degree. But it does not work in an, in an industrialized economy. I really don't want to give up plumbing, vaccinations, and the internet. If you are willing to do so, feel free. Most of the rest of us would rather not. I like trade. Trade makes possible a great division of labor. I like being able to call on an expert in some field like medicine or electrical matters. When I get cataracts, I like being able to get a replacement lens in my eyes so I can see clearly. To see why that medium of exchange is necessary for a great division of labor, you need to remember human nature. First off, people are lazy. That was necessary for our survival tens of thousands of years ago because from time to time there would be a shortage of food. That meant that our bodies needed to get along using a minimum of food for moving arms and legs. So built into our brains, there's an impulse to do things using the least effort. Yes, I know that some people can't seem to stop moving, but that's a whole different problem usually associated with childhood. This lazy impulse means that we do just enough to get by most of the time and veg out in front of the TV watching mindless drivel the rest of the time when we aren't sleeping. So people are lazy. Why should I work for someone I never met when I'm getting nothing in return? Where's the motivation? Sure, I realize that everyone has to contribute, but I'm lazy and need some immediate motivation to get me moving. It's so tempting to sleep late or put off doing that work. I'll get around to doing it later, or perhaps next week. And since when I fail to do my part, nothing in particular happens, I don't learn to defer gratification, since I get gratified anyway despite my failing to do my part. It's true that not everyone is lazy. Not everyone fails to defer gratification. Not everyone is a slacker willing to live on the hard work of other people. But many are lazy. Many don't defer gratification at all well. Many people are slackers. It's quite common for a team of people working on a project to have almost all the work be done by just one or two of the team members. So to rely on a gift economy, an economy which has no medium of exchange, can only work when there are other powerful incentives besides that medium of exchange to get people to work. Small groups can do it. In small groups you don't want to let down your friends. In small groups you know you'll get a bad reputation if you're irresponsible. In small groups you know that everyone will soon learn about any failures on your part. Besides, in small groups it's obvious that you all depend on one another. Everybody getting together for a barn raising back in the 1800s on the frontier was an example of a manifestation of a gift economy activity. So a gift economy can actually work quite well in a small community of no more than a couple hundred folks. But what about those strangers who live hundreds of miles away and whose names you don't even know? Are you really going to crawl out of your warm bed on a cold November morning at 6 a.m. to work to keep them living happy when you don't even know if they appreciate what you're doing for them? Well again, some will and some won't. And there are enough who won't that the gift economy the economy in which people just do nice things for others for no particular reason simply will not function. Charity has never taken care of all the poor. If it could, we'd have no poor children going to bed hungry. We can't get along, therefore, without a medium of exchange. What about a standard unit of account? That lets us assign a comparison value to goods and services. Do we need such a thing? I think we do. How do we compare the resources used to produce item A with the resources used to produce item B? A and B are constructed of different materials using different tools and different job skills by different kinds of labor. Money's standard unit of account allows us to make such a comparison. Item A is worth $123, whereas item B is worth $321. So we should be using item A if both will meet our needs. If there were no standard unit of account, how could that comparison be made? I won't wait for your answer since there is no way. Last, we come to the store of value function. 
Putting something aside for a rainy day is simply prudence. The Boy Scout motto, Be Prepared, applies here. And what are we going to need on that rainy day? You don't know, do you? None of us can predict the future in such detail. We put emergency supplies in our cars during the winter in case we get caught in a blizzard and have to survive for a few days being trapped. But that's an emergency we can plan for. Rainy days come in all kinds of circumstances. We need something that will be useful in a variety, a very wide variety of situations. Naturally, a good store of value fits that bill. A good store of value will help us to acquire whatever goods and or services we may need. If we have a moneyless economy, what will provide that store of value? Perhaps whatever we happen to need when that emergency situation comes to pass will have been stored in good supply by others who will just give us what we need. But why would they do that? Why would they go to the trouble and effort of producing those goods and storing them when they might never be used? Perhaps you have neighbors who are storing food and other necessities in preparation for a natural or man-made disaster. Do you think they're storing those necessities in order to hand them out to anyone who happens to need them? You might ask them what their intentions are along that line. You might also ask if they own any guns. I don't really think you can do better than to store some commodity money, which is what those neighbors are actually doing. Food and other necessities become a commodity money when an economy collapses for one reason or another. Wine and cigarettes became medium of, of, of exchange for many Germans when they suffered hyperinflation during the 1920s. Cigarettes became a medium of exchange in POW camps in Europe during World War II. Commodity monies simply get invented whenever the need for a store of value becomes acute in the absence of, other, of some other kind of money. Our conclusion must be that common ownership and moneyless economies work only for hunting and gathering economies and not for agricultural, industrialized, or information economies. Those happy souls who can get along without spending money can do so only in the context of an economy that supports them. I see none of the pictures of those, these folks doing without clothes. The clothes they wear in the pictures were manufactured from money. Their tools were manufactured from money. They depend on the very economies they scorn. But what these folks oppose is not actually the functions of money. It's the consequences of the physical object nature of the money we use. I think they could cheerfully live in a non-POM economy. They could even live without spending money. They could give and accept gifts as necessities and even luxuries. They could defend the ecology in our flora and fauna. They could, in other words, have their cake and eat it too. They could have all the benefits of what they see as a moneyless economy with none of the sacrifices they see as products of money.